can show you our slides real fast. No, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> we really are. I mean, I, I have it printed out if you want to take a quick peek at what they are. Seriously. Yeah. 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 Sure. yeah. I didn't bring a printed out copy. Yeah. Mm still coming in. I'll give people a couple more minutes. This isn't important for visual. Okay. Should, I just, should we get started? You can. You want to? I think I'm just going to. I think we're going to get started here. Um, so um, I'm Sandra Friedman. I'm a developmental pediatrician, and I'm here with Dr. Terry Katz, and she's a psychologist. And we're honored to be here um, to talk to you about challenging behaviors in um, children and adults with CDK05. Um, so um, Dr. Katz and I work together in the RAT clinic. We also, also work together in developmental pediatrics. And so one of the things we do in clinic together um, is address behavioral challenges, both from medical uh, standpoint as well as behavioral standpoint. Um, so we have no disclosures. Um, so for, for this talk, we're going to talk a little bit about medical contributing factors to behavioral issues, um, behavioral contributing factors to challenging behaviors, and some interventions, both medical and behavioral. And the issues that we're really talking about primarily are self-injurious behaviors, aggressive behaviors, 
abrupt mood changes, and inconsolable crime. Okay. And there's not a magic bullet for any of these, um, but we'll just tell you some, some of our thought processes uh, um, that we think about when we see um, people in clinic. Okay, so we really try to integrate both the medical and the behavioral issues. Um, we always try to rule out some type of an organic ideology if there is one, because that's something we, we could treat. Doesn't mean that's the only reason, but if there's some specific medical reason for irritability or crying or self-injury, then we really want to identify it and address it. Um, and, and then we also characterize the behavior um, by observation and by taking a good history. Um, we consider um, potential co-occurring psychiatric problems so individuals with developmental disabilities, not just CD8, KL5, um, have increased risk of psychiatric problems compared to the general population. And so often um, it's attributed to the development, um, some of the behavioral issues are attributed to the developmental issues, but there may be a co-occurring psychiatric uh, condition as well that needs to be addressed. Um, we usually start with a behavioral approach or changing the environment um, with regards to addressing the specific behavior rather than starting medication to address the behavior because um, medication is never quite the magic wand. Um, and then we consider medication to treat the symptoms if behavioral intervention is not adequate um, and there's not a specific indicator of a psychiatric disorder that we said, oh, this. Uh, looks like bipolar, we need to treat bipolar. And then we really need to target the specific symptoms. So um, I'm just going to go through some of the things that, that I look at when I, um, when I see a child and when I take a history to make certain we're not missing something medical. Um, and some of this I'm certain you already know about. The corneal abrasions are sometimes hard to identify. The kids could, could scrape their cornea. Um, and that's very painful. Um, infections of ears, throats, and sinuses. Sinus infections often go unidentified. Kids with recurrent congestion could have an untreated sinus infection. Dental um, abscesses or even dental caries and gingivitis um, are often under um, uh, identified less frequently um, than they should be. Um, urinary tract infection, menstrual cramping, um, rashes could cause irritability because of itchiness, um, obviously pressure sores, um, air swallowing, so if people are swallowing a lot of air and have a lot of abdominal distension, they could be very uncomfortable. Gastrointestinal reflux um, could be very uncomfortable when kids swallow. Um, constipation um, is actually a cause for a lot of discomfort, and actually there's been some articles that say if you're really constipated and impacted, that could even trigger more seizures. So um, it's important to kind of identify potential uh, factors. Um, impaired mobility, when your gut isn't moving the way it should, and rectal fissures, if you have like a little cut in the, in the rectal area, um, could be very painful. And obviously, seizures and headaches. Sometimes kids um, have a history of a lot of irritability, but it always seems to be related to seizures, and so we're, um, the, we need to treat the seizures and address the seizure disorder um, before you could really tease down if there's anything else um, going on. Fractures are undiagnosed, so osteopenia, osteoporosis are, is very common in any um, individual with disabilities who have impaired mobility, less weight bearing, who are on anticonvulsants, it affects um, bone density, so there's increased risk of seizure of fractures. Um, muscle tone abnormalities, significant spasticity could be very uncomfortable. Um, um, and there's even things called a hair tourniquet that sometimes people don't even identify. If one little hair kind of wraps around a finger, um, it actually could could um, cut into the skin and be very, very uncomfortable. So you really want to do a head-to-toe evaluation of a child. Um, esophagitis, um, inflammation of the esophagus, um, aspiration pneumonia, um, vision and hearing impairment could cause some irritability. Some kids with significant vision impairment will rub at their eyes, poke at their eyes, um, and be uncomfortable. Um, 
And actually, even there's psychosocial issues that need to be under, um, identified too. So loss of a caregiver, loss if a brother or sister goes away to college, that really could affect somebody's behavior and that really needs to be acknowledged and addressed. Um, a, a, a change in a home environment, change in a caretaker. Um, and in general, sleep. We just, um, Dr. Katz and I just recently completed a, a study of the, um, of the uh, people, who, the patients we saw in clinic with CDKL5, and we found the majority of the, the individuals we saw in clinic have some type of sleep issue. And so the problem is if you don't get a good night's sleep, it affects your mood, it affects your attention, it affects your interaction with the environment, and there's things we could do about that to make, um, to make life a little bit easier for everybody. Um, medication, sometimes you're, um, pe people are on multiple medications and the combination could um, be problematic, um, and as well as sensory processing issues. Too much noise, um, you know, textures of certain things um, that they either eat or touch. And so you have to look at sensory processing issues as well, and there are things we could do to address that as well. So um, from the medical approach, we always talk about when did these most concerning behaviors start. We're not talking about a little bit of crying here and there, a little irritability. We're talking about really a lot of self-injury, a lot of irritability, crying inconsolably for long periods of time. So was there a trigger, you know, either psychosocially, medically, um, change in environment that we really want to look at? And also, what's the trajectory over time? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Is it, um, and so looking at the course, or has it been bad for a while and then plateau? Because that'll give us information about potential cause. Um, and then um, we want to know how this is really interfering with um, the, the child's function, um, which, um, which will help us in determining how to best intervene. We do family medical history of psychiatric problems, and we also talk about the impact of behaviors on others. We can't really just look at the child in isolation. We really have to look at the whole family. And also with behavior, how are, you, how are family members or caregivers responding to the behavior? Because sometimes, unknowingly or unwittingly, the, the negative behavior could be reinforced. So if every time, if somebody doesn't want to do something and they cry and they start hitting, and then they're, they're, they're hugged and kissed, and they, you may be inadvertently reinforcing that. So you really have to look at what happens before the behavior, what is the behavior, and what happens after the behavior. With Dr. Katz, we'll talk about to see if inadvertently we're, the negative behavior is being reinforced. Um, so uh, this is similar to the review of system issue that we that I talked about and what we're looking at. So in exam, we really look at all the different systems, skin, the head, the ears, eyes, nose, throat, chest, um, just to make certain that we're not missing anything. Um, and sometimes, actually, if we don't see something on exam, we may need to do, like if you're concerned about a fracture, you may need to do an x-ray or you may need to do some imaging studies that you cannot see on exam if you have a high index of suspicion that something medical is going on. Um, so, so, so if you identify something medical that potentially could be at exacerbating um, behavior, then you treat it. So antibiotics, if you have an ear infection, a sinus infection, um, a pneumonia, um, medication for reflux, medication for constipation, muscle relaxants, um, analgesics for pain, um, some equipment too. So if kids really um, have a lot of uh, motor issues or abnormalities in t a muscle tone, some orthotics um, can be helpful too. And then um, sometimes if kids have um, significant sleep issues, particular if they're snoring frequently and you're concerned about obstructive sleep apnea, you may need to do a sleep study. That kids may need to have their tonsils or adenoids out. Um, or, and, and sometimes kids wake frequently during the night because of periodic lid movement or restless sleep, sleeping and iron therapy sometimes could help them sleep more soundly and then they have a better night's sleep and they may not be as irritable the next day. And obviously you want to treat seizures. Um, 
And then in terms of pain assessment tools, these are pain assessment tools that most people don't use at home, but they can. Um, but they're often used in, in, like in the hospital or other centers. And these are for non-verbal individuals to see what is their baseline. Because you know when they're at their baseline, everybody may be irritable here and there, but what's their baseline? And then when is it getting worse? So there are a number of tools, and I'm not going to read through all them, but there are tools that people use to say what's the child's baseline level of behavior, and is it worse than the baseline? What's making it better? What's making it worse? Um, which could help um, kind of guide your treatment. And so now I'm going to have uh, Dr. Katz talk a little bit about behavior, and I shall return. Thanks, Dr. Friedman. Okay, so we want to talk a bit about the behavioral piece. As Dr. Friedman was saying, we want to rule out any medical conditions, but we want to think about behavior as well. And sometimes we can do those both at the same time. So it's not always an either or. Sometimes it's both, and we can look at both at the same time as well. So there are different um, ways that we can gather the information we need. Probably the most important is caregiver observations. You know your children. You know the individual you're working with well. Um, what are you seeing? What does it look like? There's something called functional behavioral assessment or analysis, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. There are some rating skills, just like the pain skills. And then videos can be really helpful, too. If you're talking with other providers about a behavior that's concerning, sometimes it helps to just take a picture of it so you can kind of see what's going on. Um, it's often more helpful than just trying to describe information. So I wanted to mention that as well. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are some behavior rating scales, and some of them are specifically um, developed for people who are minimally verbal, but others are more general. But they do help try to target, what are we talking about? Are we talking about anxiety? Are we talking about mood? What kind of challenging behaviors? And sometimes it helps put in context, is this something that's atypical, or is this something we would just kind of expect? We all get a little anxious once in a while. Dr. Friedman mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we're really talking about more extreme behaviors, um, but these checklists and rating scales can really help us sort of understand this a little bit more. So again, the behaviors are really, or your observations about the behaviors are really important and helpful. So some of the questions we want to know is when did the behavior start? And related to that, and again, Dr. Friedman mentioned this earlier, maybe there's a change in environment, maybe move to a new place, new care providers, maybe someone's come in and out of the home, you're in a new home, maybe there's a new schedule. Sometimes we'll um, talk with children where they've moved from one classroom to another and suddenly there have been new changes. And it's not about the new teachers not being as good as the old teacher. There's just something different about the environment that we need to address and look at. So thinking about any, anything that's new, anything that's changed along with that behavior can help give us some clues about what's going on. We also, of course, want to think about breaking up these behaviors into different ways. So physiological or medical, we're discussing that. Environmental, is there something about the environment that's triggering the person? Is it too loud, too noisy, too many people coming in and out? Maybe it's too quiet. Um, we want to think about that. Are there specific tasks or um, things that we're requiring an individual to do that maybe they don't like, that's hard for them, difficult, anxiety-provoking? can think through that and, and do the behaviors tend to occur in that when we're asking them to do those tasks? Are there certain events that happen that trigger the behaviors? Or are we really talking about some things that the individual is usually concerned about and we need to address that? Maybe it's being separated from um, a family member that's really important to them and whenever that separation occurs they're more anxious and so we want to address that as well and think about that. Okay, so mentioned functional behavioral assessment. It's really an important piece of trying to sort this all out. And Dr. Friedman was talking about this a little bit when she said like maybe sometimes we might inadvertently be reinforcing a behavior that we actually don't want to see. So there's that end, but there's also what's triggering the behavior, what's happening. So it's often very helpful to do a functional behavioral assessment. People who are trained in doing this can come into a home or into a classroom or into a day program to look at this. And some of the things they're going to look at are what are the setting events? What, where, are we, where is this happening? What does it look like? What's happening before the behavior that's concerning? So you have to spend time doing this, right, so that you get the concerning behavior. But then you look, what happened right before this individual started crying or maybe hitting or doing something? 
And then what happened after? What were the consequences? And when we think of consequences, we often think about something negative, like, oh, you reprimanded or whatever. But consequences can be positive, too, just as Dr. Friedman was saying. It could be like, oh, let me give you a hug or a kiss. Or, no, you don't have to do this task after all if you're upset. We'll just stop and we'll let you avoid that. So we want to look at that. None of it was a judgment about someone doing something wrong, both the individual and the, the people surrounding that person, but it's more in understanding what's going on with this behavior. How can we understand it? And then how can we change it in a positive way? All right. So again, another way to think about functional behavioral assessment is who's involved? Does that make a difference? What is happening? When does it happen? And where does it happen? And sorting through all that is going to help us, again, lead to solutions. So another way to think about this is, let's say we're talking about an individual who has some behavioral difficulties. We've ruled out medical pieces. We know there's something about the environment and how they're reacting to the environment. So then we take a very positive approach in saying, we can fix this. When we know what a problem is, we can start working on solutions. And this is a way to start moving toward finding those solutions. OK, so again, most typically, when we're thinking about a behavior that doesn't have a medical piece and is really something about behavior, most often, you're behaving a certain way to get something you want, to gain attention, or maybe to avoid or escape something. And that's part of what a functional behavioral assessment will help us know. What is the function of the behavior? What's happening around that? What are you trying to do? And how can we help you do that? How can we either help you get that thing, help you get attention, or not do something that must be so hard that you're willing to, you know, you're, you're in a state where you're going to cry or hit or do something to avoid it. We don't want to keep presenting you with that exact same task over and over again. That's not the answer. The answer is to change that task and give you more better coping strategies so you can handle it. And if you can do both of those at the same time, you can start working on changing the behavior. So this is another way of looking at what, what we're trying to understand around this is what's the antecedent? So you know, if you go to the middle of the orange square, what's the behavior? What are we actually looking at? Crying. OK, when does this individual start crying really inconsolably? OK, what seems to happen right before that? Let's see if we can sort out what that is. And then after that, what's the response? What do we all do when this individual cries? And then we could start to figure out what this is all about. And the trigger could, again, we want to look at who's involved, when, where, what, what are we asking that individual to do. So we can really start to understand it. I'll say sometimes it's like there's no pattern. And then we maybe go back to medical and we say, well, we didn't think there was a medical, but there isn't a pattern. Other times it's, it's very clear that there's some changes we can make based on this, gathering this information. So then, of course, we want to come up with a plan. It doesn't really help that much to just know that and just go like, oh, well. So we can think about making changes to the physical environment. Maybe it needs to be quieter. Maybe the lights need to be low. We need some common music. I mentioned before, we want to adjust the task demands so that they're reasonable. Something's not reasonable about what we're asking this individual to do. Doesn't mean we can't ever ask them to do this thing ever. It means we maybe need to break it down into very small steps. So the first step's easy and they can do it. Then we can build up to it. Um, we want to change perhaps the antecedents or the consequences or both. And we want to teach a new behavior. So we're teaching this individual a new way to let us know that this is hard. So they don't have to escape it. They can say no. They can, they can have maybe a sensory object to play with. They can learn to step away or move away from something. So we need to think about what's appropriate around that. But we can come up with a plan. And it's always a process. So you know, you collect your data, you kind of review, you evaluate that, and you put a plan into place. And then you either continue with that plan because it's perfect and you got it right the very first time, or much more likely, you're going to modify it based on more data you get. And then you're going to collect more data and keep going. So it's an ongoing process. Um, it's rare that you're going to just hit it right the first time and come up with a, a really, really perfect plan but whatever you do, you get more data, and then you can move on to the next step. OK. So when we think about you know, coming up with a good plan, some of the things that I always like to try to keep in mind as we're developing the plan is the importance of these factors, which is socialization, making sure that the individual is getting the amount of interaction that they need. Maybe they need some breaks from some social interaction. Maybe they need more. 
but it's an important part of who we all are and we need to respect that and honor that as we think through a good plan. What are their communication skills and how can we make that happen in a way that works? How can we help them let us know what's bothering them in a, maybe a more um, adaptive way than what we've been seeing thus far? Um, physical activity is always important. Getting out, moving around in whatever capacity you can. Um, having a stimulation so that you've got, and again, this is all titrating it so that it's the right amount for each individual. And then giving an individual choices, because we all, we all do better when we could say, you could do this or this. Which one do you want to do? Instead of you have to just do this and there's nothing else you can do. So, and the choices can be carefully made. So it's not like, you know, do you, um, want to have breakfast at all. Oh, no, okay, you can skip it, but what do you want for breakfast? Do you want this or this? You can choose. Okay. I think thinking through calming activities is often really helpful when we're talking about challenging behaviors. Again, it's going to um, vary greatly from individual to individual in terms of what will work, but some of the things we often will think about is calming music, favorite videos. Aromatherapy can often be really calming and massage emotion, things like that. Um, I think using visuals can often be very helpful. I think we sometimes take for granted that an individual might be really overwhelmed by what we're trying to communicate to them and what's expected of them and what's going to happen next. And those are things that often make someone more anxious and have more difficulties with mood. So again, it's going to vary from individual to individual about how complex a set of visuals will be and how we would use those. But thinking about making things visuals so you can see them. What, here's what I want you to do, here's what you get to do next. And these are just a few examples of the kinds of things. I know many individuals have devices that work, but you can always go with old-fashioned object schedules, which sometimes work really nicely too. Okay, so again, we just want to kind of think about the basics when we're talking about difficult behaviors. So often it's about transitions and being prepared for those, understanding those, big and little transitions, having really clear communication in whichever way works best for that individual, being calm, not much easier to say than do, but being calm, and then just lots of praise, lots of positive for all the good things, because I think we sometimes forget that and we focus on a behavior that's challenging and, and we forget that an individual who maybe has, you know, some part of the day that's really hard for them, they've been functioning really well the rest of the day, and we want to make sure we give lots of reinforcement for that as well. So there are other talks on today around functional communication, but I well, we think it's important to mention when we talk about challenging behaviors because often that's an important piece of why we're seeing an individual having difficulties with mood or anxiety or aggressive behavior is that they can't communicate to us. So we always want to make sure that we've, we've thought about that and that individual is learning or has ways to let us know, to be able to say no. Sometimes just being able to say no helps a lot because if you can't, then you're going to have to swipe something away. You're going to have to swipe at someone to let them know they don't want something. But if you've got a way to say no, that can make all the difference in the world. And just a simple switch that lets you say no um, can really help. And you know, saying no, sometimes we say no and we still have to do what we want to do. But we've gotten to say no and we know the individual doesn't want to do it and we can go from there with that. Um, so I mentioned substitute behaviors. So when we see a number of individuals where it's about biting or scratching or needing some kind of, um, feels like a piece of it at least, is needing some sensory input. And so not overlooking that and thinking through, is there something else we can give you when you're upset um, so that you don't have to engage in the kind of behaviors that might hurt someone else and you've got something else you can hold or chew on, do, and again, what what will work is going to vary in terms of an individual's um, specific needs, but um, going back to some of those basics sometimes helps and making sure that if that is something that works for an individual, that it's always there for them and they can access it on their own or have someone help them get to it. Same with sensory. Sensory, um, a lot of, there's a lot of nice sensory um, supports out there now. Um, some of them are visual, some are more tactile, um, but you know, Sometimes it's as simple as having like a, a weighted pad on your, on your lap that just gives you a little more support and can be a little more calming. There's lots of therapies, um, I, and probably not an exhaustive list, and 
hippotherapy. Someone was telling me the other day that we really need to just start saying horseback riding therapy instead of hippotherapy because it sounds like, like hippopotamus therapy or something. So sorry, but um, this went out before that person mentioned that to me. But anyway, one of the reasons I mentioned these therapies and have this slide is they all can help with mood. I mean, again, you think about some of the movements you need, your physical therapy, OT. And these therapists often have really good ideas about ways that they can help with a particular problem. So if we're talking about communication, we want to go back to our speech language therapist and say, what do you think about a switch for yes or no? Or what do you think about adding something to the device to let the individual know I need to be alone right now? Something like that. Um, same with OT, you know, OTs are great. I've learned so, so much from them. And they've got great ideas about calming strategies and sensory techniques that might work. Physical therapists can help think about ways to get more exercise in a way that works for that particular individual and their movement needs. Um, and then working with a behavior therapist, ABA is Applied Behavioral Analysis, and they know all about functional behavioral analysis and about consequating behavior and thinking through um, ways to help support um, more positive behaviors. So um, often including someone like that on your team can make a big difference. Okay. For individuals who are really anxious, it can help to get very specific um, around teaching some of the strategies that would help someone be less anxious. So if they've got, sometimes it's about a specific fear and families and caregivers can know that it's about, you know, animals or bees or weather. So we can help an individual learn to be less anxious about that when it's generalized anxiety, which is also very common. We can work on that. I, there are different strategies that are going to work for different people around that, but you really can start working on some ways to help build some experiences in a really slow, gradual way where an individual can learn to tolerate what's making them anxious. Um, something that often happens when we love someone who's anxious is we try to help them avoid that anxiety-provoking situation, and that makes it better for just that moment, but then there's no practice or no way to learn how to then cope with that situation. So one way to address that is say, well, we're going to come up with little baby steps around you dealing with this instead of avoiding it all together so that you could start to learn to do this. Because um, otherwise, the way anxiety works is it actually gets worse um, when you don't have any experience with it, and then it generalizes to even you know, harder things. So if, you're worried, if someone's afraid of thunderstorms, they'll start getting afraid when they see clouds in the sky because that could mean there could be a thunderstorm. And um, if everyone helps them avoid all that, it gets more and more difficult to address anxiety as opposed to like learning like, well, actually that was okay, I did that, and teaching some coping strategies to handle it at the same time. So again, we just want to think through as we're thinking through these challenging behaviors, what physical considerations are there, we can think about behavioral intervention, and there is a role for medication, which I'm going to let Dr. Friedman talk with you more about. Okay, so we talked a little bit about, you know, medication is never the magic wand, and we never for always start first to address behavior um, with medication for any child, actually. I mean, and even if you put somebody on medication, you always have to have a behavioral component because there often is a learned component to it as well. So um, medications off, um, act on the central nervous system. It changes the, the way... Um, chemicals in the brain send messages, so, so those are neurotransmitters, and um, between cells through a sy synapse or a crossing. And so how the, how the nerve cells communicate with each other. Um, and that's the basis for a lot of the medications we use um, to affect the chemicals um, in the brain. Um, and each different psychotropic medication really target specific behavior. So when you choose a medication, you really have to know what behavior you're targeting. All different medications work good on one big behavior but not on another. So you really need to work with somebody who knows, you know, how to determine what behavior you need to treat. Um, and so just to talk a little bit about, and this is maybe more detailed than you even want, but just about some of the um, psychopharmacologic treatments and the neurotransmitters, um, there are certain medications that act on certain um, neurotransmitters. So like dopamine, medications for um, um, aggressive behavior, self-injurious behavior, irritability, we often are, we 
not often, but we sometimes use atypical antipsychotics, and that works on the dopamine uh, pathways. And things for like ADHD, amphetamines, um, and uh, methylphenidate, that's also dopaminergic. Uh, serotonin is, all, is a medication that we use for like antidepressant medication, anti-anxiety medication. So the tricyclics are the are antidepressant medications that we generally don't use very much. Well, sometimes we use a low dose for sleep, but um, there's a lot of side effects with it. But instead we use the um, SSRIs like Zoloft or Prozac. Um, and then there's opi opi opioidergic medication, naltrexone. This is actually, naltrexone is used for opioid overdose. So, um, so people take opioids, for, you know, there's this whole big opioid um, epidemic now in the U.S. and they t people take it for pain. And so now there's a lot of um, if people overdose, they're given this medication. So this medication has been used in some children for self-injurious behavior because it's more complex than just saying they have a high pain threshold, so you're going to lower the pain threshold. Um, but it has been used in some children for self-injurious behavior. Um, adrenergic is the things like clonidine, propanol. So clonidine is used for sleep, is used for ADHD. Propanol is um, sometimes used for anxiety. Um, uh, GABA is gamma aminobutyric acid. Um, so valproic acid is an anti-seizure medication, but it's also used for mood. Um, and glutamatergic medication like lamictal, um, lamotrigine, um, um, that's a medication also used for seizures as well as for mood. So more specifically in terms of medications for tar the target behaviors that we, um, that we look at um, when we're trying to decide what medication. So alpha-2 agonists, which is an adrenergic medication, guanfacine and clonidine, those are approved for ADHD. So it, it, um, impulsivity, short attention span, hyperactivity. It also is sedative, so sometimes we give it in the evening to help um, people go to sleep. Um, and it's also used for tics. Um, so, it, so that may be a choice um, when you're trying, when these are the, the, the um, the behaviors that are interfering with somebody's functioning. Um, stimulant medications, um, like, like for ADHD, methylphenidate, amphetamines, um, hyperactivity, short attention span, impulsive behaviors, we use them but not quite as often as, as these medications, just because this could also, one of the side effects is anxiety um, and irritability. Sometimes it does help, but um, we use it less often in kids with severe developmental disabilities. Um, Anti-anxiety medications we use for depression and anxiety as well as kind of OCD-like behavior. So if people have like repeating thoughts, repeating behaviors, um, sometimes we will use that. Um, that there's a black box warning with those medications, um, but it, um, which just means there's increased risk of suicidality or suicidal ideation, but that's really more for people who are significantly depressed, almost vegetative, and when they come out of um, their severe depression, they may act on their impulses. We use a very low dose. It really doesn't apply for, for the kids with significant developmental disabilities, but we, we always tell families about it because they should know that um, about the different medications. And when we start medications, we always talk to families about pros and cons and side effects because there's not just one way to do it and we never will push medication unless the family's comfortable with it and wants, wants to um, give it a try. Um, and then there's these atypical antipsychotic medications. So risperidone, which is risperdal, aripiprazole, which is Abilify. Those actually are FDA approved for kids with autism who have problems with aggression, irritability, self-injurious behavior, um, tantrums, um, sleep problems, high activity levels, and tics. Um, but we use other atypical antipsychotics, just not those two. 
sometimes as well. But it's not just for kids with autism. We use that um, in kids with Rett syndrome, with CDKL5. If, they're beha if you, you're really ruled out medical, you're, you have an intense behavioral program, and then it, it's somebody, it's just really hard for the family to function because of a lot of acting out behavior. Um, always start very low, they're very slow, there's monitoring labs that need to be done, there's significant side effects that could go uh, along with it, so you really need to monitor kids closely. There's something called target dyskinesia, which is kind of involuntary motor movements, and if somebody um, starts showing that, we usually take them off the medication. So you really, we don't take this lightly, and we, that's cer certainly not the first line of treatment but sometimes it's really a matter of having a child be able to stay in the home and function well within the context of their home. Um, and then there's medications that are both for seizures and for mood. So, so um, uh, like Lamictal, Oxcarbamazine, Oxcar I always do this, um, Oxcarbamazine, or Ox whatever, Trileptal, Trileptal, okay. So, um, so seizures, mood, aggression, self-injury. Um, I've, had, I've had patients where we've tried the Risperidone first and we've tried other medications. And then we go back in family medical, and kids are really acting out. Um, and then we go back in family medical history and there's a, somebody in the family with bipolar disorder, a significant mood disorder, and then we put them on a mood stabilizer and they, they're better. I mean, it's not Nirvana, but they are better. Um, and th there's other medications for mood too. Um, so in terms of determining what medication, um, you re review the pros and the cons before starting medication. It really has to be shared decision making. I mean, parents, it, it's, their, it's their child, it's, they, they have to be on the forefront of making the decision and comfortable doing it. Um, you talk about common side effects, less common side effects, what to look for. Um, you never start a medication. I mean, if the side effects are worse than the, if the good, the negative is worse than the, is more prominent than the positive, you don't want a child on that medication. I mean, it's really to improve a child's functioning, um, so you don't want a lot of side effects. Um, some, some medications need monitoring labs, and so um, you need somebody who knows how to, who knows psychopharmacologic treatment, um, for individuals with behavioral difficulties. Um, and a lot, there, it's not, there's not a cookbook. I mean, it's a lot of it's trial and error. And sometimes they're even within the same category of medication, um, you know, one brand may work and one brand may not. And so it really is trial and error. Um, and it always, as we've said multiple times, um, should be used in conjunction with behavioral and therapeutic approaches. Okay, so I think a lot of the, the approach to these behavioral issues um, to really improve quality of life, quality of life for um, the individual who we're treating as well as quality of life for the family um, because severe anxiety and mood, disrupt, mood problems and disruptive behavior certainly has been identified as having um, a negative impact in quality of life. And, and so um, that's why we, as part of our team and our clinic, we address these issues um, as looking at the whole individual and the whole family too. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention. We're, um, Dr. Katz and I are happy to take questions about um, anything we talked about. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, I believe it's Valprocacid, which is the Depakote, um, for seizures. Um, but we also have mood issues too, and we just started um, Banzel, um, Rufinamide, I believe that's what it's called. And um, the side effects for Banzel were <laughs> mood issues. <laughs> and, and so I, I'm wondering if that is playing out in him uh, psychologically, and if there are ways, you know, uh, from from your standpoint, as opposed to an epileptologist, you know, kind of your thoughts on that? Thank you for that question. Um, 
So we do, we, you know, we talk, we treat, we, t we work with our neurologists, and if, you know, and that's why when we do a history about when the mood issues became worse, and it seems like there's a time relationship to starting a new medication, whether it's an anticonvulsant or another medication, um, we'll talk about maybe we need to try another, something else because there's another choice. I mean, it's a balance. I mean, if seizures are totally out of control and you really are trying to, to um, manage the seizures, um, you know, what's the issue that's most um, on the forefront? However, you want to look at everything. And there are, you know, so if you, if they're really, and again, I don't want to go between you and your doctor, but if there, it really seems to be time related that once you started the Banzol, the mood got worse or the irritability got worse, that may not be, there may be something else to consider. You know, there may be another medication to consider. Yes? Um, I just want to actually add to that. I'm sorry, I'm one of the epileptologists at Jim. Um, so in the past, I've been in the hospital for three months. And what I've noticed is that when the Banzol interacts together, and so when you started the Banzol about two weeks after that, you would have raised the deficit level. So it may not be a problem with the Banzol, it may be a problem with the Banzol. Problems with quarantine, so there's a variety of things that, that can lead to challenging that may not be correctly to cancel now. So that's why you need to talk to your neurologist. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, you really need to talk to the, the treating physician um, to make certain that nothing else could be All going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anything else? <coughs> yes. Um, oftentimes. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, Sometimes I feel like it's the opposite thing. Sometimes I feel like my daughter um, is so easygoing that how do I get her to be more stimulated sometimes? Where is it just that she's overstimulating and she just is lethargic as a result? Or is she like, okay, fine, I'll deal with it? And we've tried a lot of the strategies that you talked about, but I just feel like she's like, okay, I'll adapt to that and I'll just go back to the being relaxed and calm. Is it related to some of her med the medications she's on or not really? It's just more like she's more passive or? You know, <laughs> over the last four years, regardless of the medication that she's been on, behaviorally, like trying to get that, that stimulus, that like uh, intentional behavior, just trying to get her to. More interactive. Yeah. Do you want to take that one? I mean, that might be, that actually might be a good thing to talk with a behavioral therapist around in terms of what she might be motivated to do and get a good sample of what things she likes that might motivate her to go to that kind of next step so she's pretty content with anything she really would like to work toward. So it sounds like part of what you want her to do is like, do more, get engaged in, in doing something. But if there's things that she enjoys that she could work toward, that might help. Yeah. I know. It's hard. There's no magic answers, absolutely. Other questions? Yeah. Um, well, it's slightly different, but like, similarly, um, with being just a sibling who creates different behavior patterns and just, you know, typical sibling to, or what, um, what should you expect or what should you help a child that the sibling of the child is really at work? Did everybody hear the question around siblings? So, um, let me get back up. Um, so, sibling issues in terms of like the, typically the, the child who has typical development and issues around that. There's a lot of support available for that. There's um, Sib Shops is a really nice set of programs and there's a, a website that has all kinds of information. If you type in Sib Shops, you'll get to a website that has information for um, brothers and sisters of different ages, um, younger and adolescents. Um, they've actually got a nice program where they actually have a mentorship program for siblings. So the, the responses can really vary. And for some um, individuals, who, you know, brother and sister, they're, they're fine with having someone who, in the family who has special needs. And for others, it's more of a challenge. So you want to give you know, your child a chance to kind of voice their concerns. One of the nice things about sit shops is they're in with other brothers and sisters and it's easier to 
share information. There's also a couple of nice books out that um, have different, um, there's one that has different vignettes in it of different um, family members that you could read together with your child that might be helpful. So it really kind of varies. Um, I wouldn't assume anything specific. It's just like, just like we're talking about with individuals with special needs. It's a broad spectrum with a broad range of reactions. Um, but there's a lot out there to support brothers and sisters. So I hope that answers. What was the name of the book? Um, I don't remember it off the top of my head. But when we're done, I can look it up on my phone. I think it too. So I'll tell you after the talk. Anything else? Thank you so much. We appreciate it. You've been a great deal. Thank you. Thank you.